Well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate um, you being here. And I, um, I happen to live in Lafayette, Colorado, which is not that far away. So it was really convenient. And um, I'll share lots of fun things with you. So um, some of you may remember computer engineer Barbie. Um, there was a pretty big scandal about her um, a few years back. Um, but in 2000, I think it was 2010, um, we got a call from Mattel, and they were like, we're having this contest for Barbie's next career, and computer engineer Barbie actually has a shot. She's up against newscaster Barbie. And um, so, of course, we unleashed the, the world of women in technology who are all very plugged in and online, and a lot of voting took place, and computer engineer Barbie then was over the top and won, and she was the first Barbie to not wear high heels. She has what I would call Clarks, you know, they're kind of low slung pumps. The new game developer Barbie's actually wearing Keds, so she's got sneakers on. Um, and um, there was a lot of debate, is this bad, is this good to have a computer engineer Barbie? You know, what, are the, what is it saying about women and image? And I, I kind of feel like if girls are gonna play with dolls, could they please play with dolls that are in science and in technology and doing cool things? Um, and I did see the mock-up for um, newscaster Barbie, and her shoes were high, and her <laughs> skirt was short. So I'm uh, happy to see computer engineer Barbie, and her shirt actually reads by Barbie in binary code, which is kind of fun. Um, so I love that. I still have that sticker from those many years ago. Um, so this is who I am. You just heard who I am. I have a TED Talk if you want to watch that. Um, this is Yvonne Cagle, one of the uh, flight surgeons for NASA, who I believe this was at the Hidden Figures screening at the White House, which was one of the many, many amazing things I got to do at the White House. And I really feel like I was part of the Camelot of White Houses. I mean, this was such a well-oiled machine. I was in the last year of the administration. They were working very hard to run through the tape and get everything possible done. And you know, it was like, you get a national park, and you get a national park. It was like Oprah moments all of the time. Um, so it was really, really wonderful time to be there. Um, in addition to you know, my job now, which is basically being a professional feminist rabble rouser for technology, um, I do advise on a number of TV shows and other marketing efforts to get more diversity and inclusion in technology, which is something I'm really happy to be a part of. Um, I'm also a big fan of the Girl Scouts. I was at the Girl Scouts for seven years and um, continue to work with them. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a while. Um, I did go to school in Oxford, at Oxford at, for my MBA. And one thing I was um, telling the dean that we have in common is I am not a computer scientist and I am not an educator, but I work in computer science education. Um, I have a degree in communications and German and I have an MBA in social entrepreneurship. But I am someone who likes to figure out, figure out how to get big things done. And I have this marketing background um, that is really useful because sometimes the people who make great, rigorous, amazing curricula are not the people who can sell that to the public. And sometimes we need like a team approach. So that's kind of where I come in. I don't pretend to know, I mean, I know how to make a for loop or something, but I don't know how to like code myself. But I know how to find people who code. And I, I sometimes say, well, I am not an engineer, I manufacture engineers. So that's kind of what I do. Um, as the dean said, I was at the National Center for Women in IT for a long time, almost nine years. And that is an amazing organization with tons and tons of research and resources that are being created every day across the entire pipeline of how do we fix this entrenched problem of gender and technology. And as part of my work there, one of the things I'm most proud of in the whole world is aspirations in computing. Um, so back in 2000, Eight, I came back from graduate school that I had an MBA and I was all like scale, leverage, and you know all the things that MBAs say. And so the National Center for Women in IT had this award program that they had created and it um, was small, it was about 30 girls a year and Bank of America had just come on to fund it. And I'm like, the idea was, you know, if we would recognize and lift up young women doing technology publicly, what would that do for aspirations among other young women? But it was 32 girls, big deal. We need 30,000 
girls to get to this solution. So I made a franchise. I franchised, I made a toolkit, franchised it. It's now in 78, 80 locations across the United States, um, 3,600 girls this year. And I think the total number of girls in the program is around 15,000 now. And they never leave. Um, once they're in the program, they become part of a community of young women that is growing and growing. And now the oldest ones are about 30, which means they're starting to hire each other. They're starting to pull others up and create what I call a new girls network. And just this week, um, there's this foundation in New York from Nile Rogers, the, mu the musician from Chic. You know, like he was the producer for We Are Family, uh, for Sister Sledge. So he has this foundation, the We Are Family Foundation, and one of the things they like to do is identify teens that are making change in the world. So they have these global teen leaders. So I nominated like 12 girls for this thing, and there's only 32 in the world that get this designation. They come to a big summit in New York. They get a mentor for the next year to help them. So of those 32 kids, five are from Aspirations in Computing, and I only nominated three of them, so somebody else was nominating the other two. And of all the kids doing great things for the world, almost all of them were doing it through technology, through technology solutions for big problems all over the world, Africa, India, US. So I thought it was really interesting um, that this thing that everybody seems to understand is the way to make big change fast and at scale is you know, still not really available in our K-12 schools, which is a big problem. Um, one of the things I learned in business school and one of the reasons I went to business school was I was working at the Girl Scouts. The Girl Scouts, if you have read my treatise on Girl Scout cookies, which you might have read if you follow me on Twitter, um, I published this annually because everyone starts ranting, Girl Scout cookies make you fat or they're too expensive. I'm like, no, they are philanthropy and gluttony combined and that's okay. <laughs> and it is a fundraiser. Just buy the cookies and if you don't want to eat them, give them away. That's fine. Um, so I was working at Girl Scouts, which is the world's largest women's organization, the world's largest girls' organization, numbers close to 15 million girls worldwide. Um, in the U.S., there's 800,000 volunteers and 59 million alumni that were Girl Scouts. Almost every woman in Congress was a Girl Scout, every woman who's ever gone to space, every Secretary of State that's female. This organization produces leaders, and they've been doing it for 100 years. So I was working there, and I was like, this is where we get to fix the engineering problem. This is how we fix girls in STEM, is through this big network that's in every zip code in the nation. And um, so part of the reason I went and got an MBA was like, how do I go to, f how do I figure out how to do that and get business people to think about that? And that's really where I learned this idea of um, scaling through existing networks. And um, so one of the ways that we did that with aspirations and computing was all over the nation there are universities that want to do outreach to girls. But universities are adult-serving organizations. They know how to serve people over 18. There's legal implications. There's all these implications when you try to bring a bunch of middle schoolers onto your university campus. Um, also, places like, say, the Boys and Girls Club, the Girl Scouts, et cetera, they want to teach computer science, but they don't have anyone qualified to teach it. So here I had this big pool of thousands of young women high school and college girls that loved computer science, and they just started teaching other girls. And so I'm like, how do I systemize that? So we raised a bunch of money, and now any young woman in this program can get a grant of like three to $5,000 to teach computing to other girls. There are now 800 um, different program, or $800,000 that's been invested, I think 400 programs, and they've taught over 8,000 girls. It'll hit 10,000 by 2018. And the cost per girl on that program is about $100. So that's how you scale something, using an existing infrastructure. I didn't need to build programs all over the nation. I didn't need to hire staff all over the nation, because those things all exist. We just solve some of those problems. And so when you start to look at, like, how do we get computer science to all kids? We need to use the things we have. We need to use the schools. We need to use public housing. We need to use the summer free lunch program. We need to use Job Corps. Like, there's all these existing funded networks and resources that could be leveraged. My latest target is junior ROTC, because we could actually order those kids to take computer science. <laughs> so another thing that I'm really interested in is media. And um, 
the dean talked about tecnologicas. So anyone speak Spanish? So the word for technology in Spanish is tecnología. And we were trying to come up with a name for this campaign for Latinas for weeks. And finally, this girl's like, Tecnologicas. And I'm like, that is the best name ever. Mm -hmm. And it's so sticky and great. And so this campaign is available on Univision. It's in English and Spanish. It's natively shot. There are videos now, 15 videos, of actual women who are Latina that work in technology all over the nation, some at NASA, some at Oracle, some at Pinterest. And it's really inspiring. And um, this one here on the bottom, on the right, she does data visualizations for um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. That's her fellowship she's doing right now, which is so awesome. The National, uh, the Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, they're all fantastic. Uh, the one on the bottom left has four patents. And the point of this campaign was to show parents, because the percentage of Hispanics working in technology is like 4%. It's really low, right? But we're going to be a, a 30, 40 percent Hispanic population by 2050. So if we don't fix, you know, ch parents don't encourage their kids to do careers that they can't themselves help them get to, right? You're going to encourage your kids to do something that you understand, that you're part of, and that you have skills in. So if most of our engineers are white and Asian, and most of our children are black and Latino, we have a pretty big problem to overcome and it's going to break down the next few years because we haven't been teaching engineering and technology in schools at all. It's just not part of the curriculum. So this model of children of engineers become engineers breaks down pretty quickly as a society. So Tecnologicas is a partnership with Univision and Televisa to get that message and they actually just announced they have now a sitcom starring, it's kind of like Saved by the Bell with Latinas mm -hmm. and in a tech working space and they're like solving tech projects and it's all starring, you know, like 12 year old girls. It's in Spanish, I don't understand any of it, but it's not meant for me and that's okay. So. One of my other really proud things is that I get to be Latina adjacent or honorary Latina in some manner. Um, so now I'm working on CS for All. So obviously CS for All is, it's not new, and I'll talk about that in a second, but um, having the White House and the President like put, in, put their arms around it, put their name on it, say this is important, say this is a national priority, was really helpful in taking a lot of disparate efforts that were happening around the country and turning them into a movement. And social movements um, can't necessarily be engineered, right? They have to have the right ingredients coming together and the right players. And I think we have that in computer science for all. It's a pretty significant effort. No one has really added a completely new discipline to the K-12 system ever in the last, you know, 100 years. So it's a big, hard, difficult job. So I was really, really privileged to get to go work at the White House. We did have cupcakes. And I'm telling you, they look super cool and they were very popular. And if you ever had an event, you're like, we got to get the White House cupcakes. And of course, they would be so dry because by the time they printed that on them, they just didn't taste very good. But people loved them and took pictures with them, and it's my phone background. Um, and I actually, I had a small budget for stuff in my uh, fellowship, and so I ordered what I thought was um, ordering uh, 15, I was ordering 150 cupcakes, but um, they thought I was ordering 15 dozen cupcakes. And they called me, you're like, do you really want, and I was like, no, no, because I was about to burn my entire budget on just cupcakes, which, and it would have been a lot of cupcakes, and who knows. Um, so I went to the White House um, to work on computer science for all, and many, many of us in the community that, um, in the lead up to this January 30th announcement, we're in the background talking to the White House, building up things and getting ready for this big announcement. He talked about computer science in the State of the Union, which was amazing. Um, and um, he wrote a line of code. And actually down there in the corner, you could see the US Patent Office trading cards of great inventors. Um, so it was really, really amazing to have this moment in time. And he asked Congress to put up money, like $4 billion for, um, computer science. Now, you know Congress didn't actually pass a budget until it was like 
the spring of this year or something. So, so we, or spring of 2017. So we didn't get that $4 billion, but a whole lot of things happened anyway, which is pretty exciting. I also want to mention that this is not new. So the first time he talked about computer science was May 17, 2006. You can see the NCWIT logo in the left corner. That was at an NCWIT summit at the National Academies. I was standing like right here. And um, uh, Senator Udall had uh, brought him in and, um, and that was really amazing. So there's a video of that on the NCWIT website. Um, anyone a computer science professor here? Okay, a couple, so you know this. So the reason all of this work got started um, was this dip here. When you start to see 2003 to 2006, just this dive in enrollment in computer science. And people were freaking out. And um, so a lot of people started to, you know, this, in the case of women especially, um, we were seeing less and less and less women. The percentage of women went from like 37% down to as low as 10%. And um, so here we were around 2004, 5, 6. The National Center for Women in IT formed. Um, many other efforts started to form. CSTA formed to start to address this issue. Like, why don't we have computer science? What happened to it? And there's a lot of theories as to why. There was the dot-com bust. Um, there was a um, migration over to finance, and you know, lots and lots of people went to finance, and then they, you know, bankrupted the country and then left finance. Um, but this, uh, this let's get more women had to do with the fact that over 50 percent, and now inching up on 56 percent of college graduates were female, but only around 17, 18 percent of computing graduates. So just do the math on that, and you realize you've got a problem. Um, so now we're in a different situation. Enrollments are starting to surge. Lots of universities don't have enough capacity. Um, so one of the things that's of concern is how do we make sure that people still care about diversity? Why do you still care about women and minorities being there when you've got plenty of students? So um, there's a whole lot of conversation going around. What, how good is the technology when it's only made by a fraction of the population? What is gonna happen when artificial intelligence exponentially amplifies the views of a small portion of our population, because it does significantly. Every chatbot that's been introduced to the internet learns to be racist, sexist, and xenophobic in a matter of hours, because it's learning from only a certain set of voices. So having all voices at the table in the creation of technology, not just in the maintenance and the use in the digital media, but in the creation of technology is really, really important. Um, everybody knows these stats, half a million current job openings in computing, number one source of new wages, lots and lots of reasons people talk about jobs. Now, I personally don't like to talk about jobs as why we need more kids to learn computer science, because the reverse would be if we didn't have the jobs, we wouldn't need the kids to learn it, which is not true, right? Um, just same reason lack of students isn't a reason to recruit women, you should recruit women because everyone's voice should be at the table. Um, we also have learned that the problem in STEM, everybody talks about STEM, and STEM annoys me. Um, and I'll tell you, back in 2001, when they were sort of figuring out the word STEM, there was like, let's call it METS. And then it was like ETEM. Because that was a time when stem cell research was really controversial, and so nobody wanted to call it STEM, and it was confusing. Um, but it landed on STEM, and now people are like, STEAM and STREAM, and I'm like, well, that's school. Once you start adding letters, it's just school. Um, and STEM is really misleading, because what happens is people at the top, like policymakers are like, we need STEM funding. What they really mean is we need engineering and technology funding, but what they get is biology and kitchen science and environmental science. Every student in the United States takes biology. They have to. Like all students take biology, we don't have a lack of pipeline for biology. We have a lack of pipeline for technology and engineering. And so 71% of all the new STEM jobs are in computing and 8% of our graduates are in computing. So if this were just contained to the United States, that'd be fine, but we don't compete with us. We compete with India, who's pumping out 300,000 engineers a year, 
China, who's pumping out 500,000 engineers a year. If you look at the numbers of cybersecurity, people who just work in the Chinese government, it's like tenfold what we have in our entire industry. So like we've got a, we've got a serious global competitiveness problem. So one of the things that we did at the White House to address these kinds of things is, you know, we didn't have any money to give, you know, because Congress gives the money. Um, but what we did was have the most difficult event planning space in the world, but if you invite people, even with like three days notice, they will come. So it's like being able to throw a party and always know you'll fill the room. <laughs> and so I, um, one of the things we would do is we, we called it scout and scale. So let's go find the great things that are happening in the US and the great Americans doing them and show them to everyone else so that they can copy so that they can replicate, so they can scale them. We don't need to keep reinventing and relearning how to do these things. So we had the first White House Summit on Computer Science for All on September 14, 2016. And one of the things about this summit is that it's, it's a commitments thing. You don't get to come speak on this stage if you're not doing something big for computer science. So we had all these different organizations. The woman in the far left in the long skirt is Dodie Barnett from the Muscogee Creek Nation. She um, is doing pre-K computational thinking across 19 Head Start programs across their tribe. So awesome. Little tiny kids are learning numeracy and literacy using robots, learning computational thinking, and these are the most disadvantaged kids in the nation and they are like zooming ahead. So like I love the idea of the poorest kids in the nation getting a head start, literally that's what head start means, because kids in Montessori are learning this too. So shouldn't all kids learn it? So that's one of the great things of this black woman in the middle with the yellow headband. She does this amazing work on, um, she has the Algorithmic Justice League and she does uh, facial recognition software research and she has to paint her face white every time she needs to test the software because it can't see her because of the color of her skin. And if you think about the, the global implications of facial recognition software, and it's, it's all like artifacts from like the original Kodak way that they like figured out how to balance color on a brunette, on a white woman with brown hair back in you know, like the 40s has now ended up in the software and now is being amplified. What if we're using software for policing? You know, what are all the ways that facial recognition could possibly um, do harm because it has bias embedded in it? She's amazing, she has a TED talk, her name's Joy Buolamini. Um, so lots and lots, of, these are all change makers from all over the nation that are doing great things in computer science. And so over the course of the year of 2016, there were 548 organizations that made commitments to computer science for all. Um, something like 135 million in federal funds, a bunch of money that came in to put um, um, like a CS AmeriCorps together with, um, with the Corporation for um, Public Service, and this consortium, the CS for All consortium, which is who I work for now, that is sort of the home of CS for All. And we're like the place you join CS for All. I made a word cloud of all of those commitments, which was a 24-page press release. And let me tell you, getting a 24-page press release out of the White House comms department, not easy. Because <laughs> I, I had to fact check and confirm every single commitment with every single commitment maker, and then make sure that they hadn't done something awful publicly at some point in time. And, and then every speaker has to be vetted in the same way. Like, we gotta make sure they didn't, you know, do some racist rant on Twitter or something terrible. Um, so, unfortunately, the election meant that the CS for All initiative within the White House was kind of over. Um, it was actually in the top priorities on Hillary's list. Um, but we live on. And so um, we now are um, CS for All. And I will play this little clip for you. So in September, did you listen? Were you on the call? So in September, we had a community national call to talk about computer science for all. And we weren't allowed to tell who our special guest was. We were just like, special guest, everyone show up. And, um, and I'm sure you can guess who our special guest was. And uh, let me see what I need to do to get to this course. Ah, there it is. There we go. Wait. 
this critical skill. Uh, it's becoming fundamental. I'm start over. Sorry. I strongly believe every child has to have the opportunity to learn uh, this critical skill. Uh, it's becoming fundamental, just like reading and writing and math. Uh, we are inundated with technology, and I don't want our young people to just be consumers. I want them to be producers uh, of uh, this technology and to understand it, to feel that they're controlling it as opposed to it controlling them. And I know there are a lot of young people at school listening today. Uh, I want you guys to know how proud I am of all of you, how much I believe in you, and I can't wait to see the amazing things that you're going to build. Uh, you know, computer science is changing virtually every industry from ma manufacturing to health, and I want to make sure that our young people learn it so you can be in the driver's seat. Uh, to be active citizens in our society, you've got to understand how technology works under the hood. So uh, I could not be proud of the work that all of you are doing. The fact that you are keeping it going and have maintained momentum uh, is something that I couldn't be more grateful for. And uh, as you do this important work, uh, just remember to keep inclusion and rigor and sustainability in your sites. Those things aren't contradictory. Elementary. Welcome, everyone. This oh, wait, is Ruth Farmer, Chief Evangelist of the CS for All Consortium. Uh, I, you don't have to hear that part, but it's fun because he goes, thanks, Ruth. And I kind of made that my ringtone on my phone. It's Because <laughs> um, <laughs> it was amazing. Um, so we lined up a whole bunch of teachers to have kids listening so that when he came on, they, were, they got to hear him. And there were these wonderful surprises. It was the first time he'd spoken publicly since leaving the presidency, so it was really fun. Um, and, you know, it means that um, despite not being the president, he still is, is supporting this work, which is really important to us. Um, so, you know, no more, have, no more White House. I don't have the best event planning space, and yet the worst at the same time because the security was a nightmare. But um, we decided to throw a summit, a summit on CS for All. So we did that in, uh, at Washington University in St. Louis. In um, October of 2017, we had about 400 people attend. We had almost 4,000 live stream viewers who some of them watched for as much as 30 minutes. And I'm sure my mom and my grandma were driving up the average, but there was still <laughs> a lot of live stream viewers. And um, those are all available online if you want to watch any of them. We had CTO Megan Smith interviewing with the president of Cartoon Network about representation in media. Lots of really great talks. But again, everyone who was on that stage had to make a commitment. And it was uh, really fun. There's the Tecnolo Chicas. That was really fun. And um, I have to say, of the funnest things I've done in my life, besides introducing President Obama on a phone call, was the ending event, which was having a group of high school kids perform CS for All to the tune of YMCA with one of the founders of the Village People. And that was amazing, also available online for viewing. So that summit, um, we announced 170 or 125 commitments from 170 organizations resulting in impact on 12 million students. And this is how we get this work done, is we invite everyone to be at the table. We invite people to participate. We make the table bigger. And we think about unlikely partners. Right? So one of my favorite stories of unlikely partners, has anybody heard of wash time is talk time? So there is a national partnership between a early childhood literacy organization and the National Association of Coin-Operated Laundromats. So there is this huge problem in that low-income kids are spoken to 30,000 words less before they are three than wealthy kids. And that impacts their development. It impacts their ability to do well in school. There's all kinds of implications of that. So this was announced at the Clinton Global Initiative a few years, and I just think it is the best example of thinking of unlikely partners. So they were like, parents, low-income parents go to laundromats, and they spend two hours at the laundromat. So should they be using that time to talk to their kids and to read to their kids? So they set up kiosks with multiple language posters and resources and books encouraging parents to use wash time for talk time to talk to their kids. And it's an inexpensive but awesome implementation. 
in computer science, there's actually a whole program where laundromats are setting up coding lessons on one night a week. They bring in a bunch of laptops, put them on top of the washers, invite the neighborhood in, there's Wi-Fi. Um, I just learned about a, um, a project in um, Detroit where they're using, it's called a mesh network. They don't have Wi-Fi, so they've got these dishes that go from one house to the next, and they, as long as they're in line of sight, they can project, and they're projecting Wi-Fi all over the low-income neighborhoods of Detroit to get internet to kids so they can do their homework. So there can be really creative solutions um, that you know go around some of the, um, the systems we think we have to rely on. So you might have seen today that the Trump administration has canceled the um, low-income subsidy for AP tests. So poor kids cannot take AP tests for free anymore, and IB as well. Um, that's terrible. But it's also an opportunity because now I can go to corporations and say, I need you to sponsor AP tests for all the kids in this state or in this city and find a way to make that happen because making AP exams unavailable to kids doesn't benefit anybody. You know, it does not benefit anybody. And they cost quite a bit of money per test to take. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, this was just announced today, so I'm assuming the College Board is going to step up into that in some manner. So a few things that I have learned in all these years of working on equity and essentially being a cheerleader. I would say like I'm a cheerleader because I try to make sure that other people are connected to each other, that they are supported in their work, and that they um, are encouraged to keep going because this long slog of social change can be really hard. You know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. So encouragement is free. One of the most powerful things I've ever heard, I had um, a girlfriend who was a computer science major, and she had gotten a job at uh, Lockheed Martin. We were roommates for a while, and she was young. And so I'm like, what got you here? Like, you are my target market. Like, what got you from A to B, graduate and all that? She'd entered college as a economics major and could not get into one of the classes she wanted, so took CS 101 to fill a slot. And her professor was Gloria Townsend. And her first exam, she turned it and she got it back. And Gloria had written, great job. Do you have a major? Come see me. And that cost Gloria virtually nothing. But it meant that Aaron became an engineer. And that kind of encouragement can go a long, long way. And you can't always assume that every child is being encouraged equally because many children are actually being discouraged. And so a little bit of encouragement to an underrepresented student can have exponential impact on their feelings of efficacy and belonging in classes where they are a minority. So it's really powerful. Um, recognition also really, really works. I've found that if you recognize someone for doing something a little bit right, they have to live up to your expectations. So, um, you know, nudge them in the right direction. So I, I had this teacher who had gotten all excited about CS Ed Week, and she launched this whole game development competition across her whole district, but she had a really hard time getting a lot of the principals to work with her. And she's like, how do I do this? How do I get these principals to pay attention? And, and you know, I had to go around them to the teachers. It was really hard. And, and I said, well, you know what? At the next school board meeting, you stand up there, you pick one principal who was even remotely helpful, and you call them a thought leader, give them an award, tell them they are amazing. And then all the rest were like, oh, you can get recognized for this? Well, maybe I should be a thought leader. So trust me, it like works to like help people along to, fee to encourage them to do the things they're doing right even more. Um, collective efforts. CS for All is not going to happen by one person, by one school, by one teacher. It's going to happen by the long, long tail of individual actors and the community college professor in West Virginia that's doing an outreach program. It's going to be all these little pieces. Um, systems are really, really sticky and change is really hard, which is good in the terms of the federal government because you can't just turn something like the Department of Education on a dime. So systems get put into place. But it's also a little scary because if you build a system that's got inequity baked in and bias baked in, it's baked in for a long, long time. So we really think about that a lot. I also think about scale from day one. Like anything you are designing at any time, 
you should think about scale at the beginning because one of the things that I I see happening all over the place is people be like, oh, I have this amazing camp and all the kids get their own laptop and it does all these great things and we spend all these hours with them. It's beautiful. It's amazing. And they're like, we have to scale this. I'm like, well, how much does it cost? Well, 150000 I'm like, how many kids are you serving? 25. I'm like, you could scale that, but you shouldn't because it's not ethical because that money could be spent so much better in a different implementation. You need to think about that from the beginning. You shouldn't just scale every little thing that is awesome because it's not awesome at scale. And I, once the camera's off, I'll tell you a really good story about that. Um, so um, inclusion must be intentional. Absolutely, you must be intentional about inclusion. It's not something that comes naturally to most people. Um, because our baseline of our society, the norm is male and white for the most part. And so we're always trying to backfill, and that shouldn't be the norm. So many years ago, I was helping launch the Lego robotics program in the state of Oregon, and I at the time worked for the Girl Scouts. And, and I was like, great, you know, a Girl Scout team troop is like tailor-made to be a robotics team. We've got 10 kids that already meet with two adults once a week. Great, let's have them do robotics. But I really wanted to make sure that the first year of this robotics tournament that it was very clear that this was for girls, that girls belonged here, that this wasn't a boy event that we were trying to add girls to. So I called up Columbia Sportswear and I was like, I need fleece vests for 60 kids. They need to match because I want people to look out at this crowd and go, gosh, there's a lot of girls here. And so I sent them a proposal and a marketing box of cookies, which is a, you can get these Girl Scout cookie boxes that have six of every cookie. And so I sent them the proposal by mail with this box of cookies. And I called them up. I was like, so are you going to be able to do this for me? And they're like, we're moving our offices this week, and we weren't going to do anything in philanthropy but yours came with cookies, so um, <laughs> how many vests do you need? So I drove around every single Columbia Sportswear outlet store in the Pacific Northwest and picked up vests until I had enough, because they all had to be really small, because they were for girls. We had them embroidered with Girl Scout Robotics team. And now to this day, that robotics tournament in the state of Oregon is the most gender balanced in the nation, because from day one, girls were there and they were visible. So I think the inclusion has to be intentional. Um, I'm big on people leveraging their core competencies. One thing that drives me crazy is when corporations are like, we're gonna fix education because y'all haven't been thinking about the bottom line. And if you were just thinking about the bottom line, you would, it's like, you have revenue. You get to think about the bottom line. In education, we don't have revenue. Our revenue is children. So it's not that simple. And so what I think is great is when corporations use their core competencies to do what they do best to help us. So. Facebook using, giving free advertising to the CS for All consortium is really helpful because we can talk to lots of parents that way. Um, and, you know, Microsoft using Skype to Skype into classrooms and talk to kids, that's really helpful. But we don't need help writing curriculum, et cetera. Like, we need help with getting our message out. Um, and Americans are super awesome. Super awesome. There are so many amazing people across this country doing amazing, amazing things, and it really, really gives me hope. And if anything, being at the White House just really gave me a lot of hope. Um, I threw in some statistics about Colorado because I thought you might be interested to know what your data is. Um, I went to the March for Science, and I was fortunate to be able to speak right before Governor Hickenlooper, so I kind of called him out from the stage about computer science education, and we got a selfie, of course. Um, but just look at that. We had 785 CS graduates in our state, and we had 13,000 open jobs last year. So do you think all 785 of those students stayed in Colorado? Nope. So I had a meeting one day with CSU and Medtronic, and Medtronic is like, well, we're, hiring, we're buying Covidian, and we're starting a laser... We, acquired a laser surgery company, so we need to hire 60 CS grads this year. And CSU was like, all our grads already have jobs. <laughs> Sorry. Like, so we have a real issue in competitiveness, and now there's this Amazon bid, right? Like, building up the pipeline of young people who are ready to be in this industry is pretty important for economic prosperity and so on. But also, 
if you follow me on Twitter, you might have read this as well. Um, this is not about jobs today. Like, three years ago, did we have VR developer jobs? Like, there's new jobs in technology literally every day. This is about creating the conditions of innovation for the future. This is like after World War II, during the space race, during the Cold War, we were pumping money into research and development and universities and education. And that got us the internet. And that got us all of the modern technology we enjoy today because we invested. The first digital camera cost $15 million and was built so that NASA could send images back from space. Because you can't send a piece of roll of film up to space and then like bring it back and develop it, right? Like that's not gonna happen. So we had to have digital cameras. Now think about all of the ways that digital cameras have fundamentally changed the way we interact, the things we do, our ability to record. Like I remember when you'd get a roll of film in your camera and you'd be like, oh, I only have 24. I'm gonna like hold off taking those pictures, you know, like it's, so I, I gave this, talk at the March for Science, I was like, CS gave you selfies. Like, you would not have selfies without computer science. Like, there's so many things that computer science contributes to. But also, it's a matter of, so I don't want computer science because I want to fill jobs. I want computer science because it's part of being a modern citizen in our world. So you do not... So Douglas Rushkoff wrote this book, Programmer Be Programmed. And he's like, it's not like you're riding the passenger seat of a car. It's like you're in Driving Miss Daisy. All the windows are blacked out. You're sitting in the back seat going, take me to the store. And you're just trusting that that car is going to take you to the store. So the people who are programming the devices upon which we rely are have a profit motive. They have biases, they have beliefs, all of those things get embedded into the software. And there's been some really startling um, data coming out about how biased big data is. Because when you're learning from smaller data sets, the impact of small pieces, so when credit, for example, a person of color with stellar credit and or no credit is less likely to get a loan than a white person with bad credit. Because the data set and the risk pool is different. So those things have implications when people just use big data, right? You're not treated like an individual. So I really think this moment in time of getting computer science to all students, it's about creating citizens of the global world. It's about creating an informed citizenry. It's about national defense and cybersecurity and having people that understand the implications of computation, the exponential impact, the exponential good and bad that it can do, because it is really powerful stuff. And with machine learning and AI and autonomous vehicles and all these things that are coming, I was in Detroit this week, the auto show is like autonomous vehicles. Like, this is going to happen. We already had a robotic truck deliver Budweiser from Kansas City to Denver last year. Now, think about how many Americans drive trucks for a living. Those jobs are gone, 10 years. We'll have robotic truck delivery really soon. And those are usually six-figure jobs that don't require a college degree, don't require much education. What happens to those people in those jobs? And how are we gonna get the people who are going to program those trucks and maintain those trucks and figure out all of that automation? That's a whole piece of building a for-all strategy that's going to make sure that everybody is at least making intelligent decisions about their future and they understand what's possible for them. So I will end there, and this is the photo. You can see it, here I am. We had a glass of wine on the lawn on the 100 days mark. So this was 100 days before the end of the administration and they invited us all over. There was a lot of us still left. Um, there were about 1,100 people that worked in the, in the White House in the office of the president. And um, it was a really, really great place to be and a great group of people to work with. I would have to say the most high-performing but humble group of people I've ever worked with. Like I, one, one of my colleagues, Lloyd, is this chief scientist of NIST, right? So he's no slouch, right? But he's like crammed into a tiny office, two, two people to an office, on a little bitty desk, working away, and like 
printing labels and picking up boxes and doing all the things that we had to do to get our work done completely humbly. And I just think that is just such a, an amazing thing. So I'm happy to take questions. So, so I have a couple questions. One is uh, some, some places like Chicago now require CS um, for high school graduation. Um, and so the question is, where do you see that going? Do you see that happening generally? And then also at the college level, like we talk a lot about Okay, so first to the Chicago thing. So Chicago is the only city to mandate computer science to graduate. Recently, um, Virginia mandated um, computer science somewhere in your K through 12 experience, which is different than saying you have to take it in high school to graduate. That's a different thing. Um, Wyoming is considering it in their current legislative thing, making it a high school graduation requirement, which would be huge. And Wyoming likes to be first, so you know that would be a good thing for them. But unfunded mandates are not popular with educators. And they've already got a ton of mandates. And one of the really big challenges, you probably heard that in September, um, the Trump administration did this big hoopla and said that they were going to prioritize $250 million this year for computer science. For, they said for STEM and computer science. Right? So that's a little nebulous, right? Um, but really what that was, was taking existing competitive grant programs and making them prioritized. So we put a lot of work into making sure that other disciplines did not feel threatened by computer science. We don't want a zero-sum game where if you add computer science, you have to get rid of something else, you have to sacrifice something. I don't want kids to not get basic literacy. I don't want to scratch special ed, right? We need, clearly, um, we need actual funding because getting trained teachers into classrooms to teach computer science is our biggest barrier right now. We already have a teacher shortage, period, but getting people who could make six figures to make half or a third so they can be a teacher, that's just not that big, good of a sell right now. Um, so I don't think that mandating a graduation requirement, it's a real stretch goal. Like, I think that each school district should assess where they are and what they're capable of and build based on that with a, you know, a strategic plan and a goal in mind. And we have services at the CS for All Consortium that provide that and help, help districts go through that process. Because I was meeting with Detroit Public Schools yesterday, they have a completely different situation. And they have an aging infrastructure, they don't have enough teachers, they've got all these issues. So like mandating something like computer science would be a huge burden on them. Um, but other affluent school districts, it's a piece of cake. So what we're hoping for is, one, we want K through five teachers to be trained in computational thinking and know what it is. They should be able to talk about it in the same way they talk about English and math and other subjects, because those are all generalists, right? So they need to understand this. So there is an effort called Home for CS to start to build the pipeline of pre-service teacher education that is going to actually inform all teachers you know, because right now most schools of education, they'll have this like applications-based computer class. Well, if, I'm sorry, if you're already like in college to become a teacher and you need to learn how to use Word and Excel, that's a problem. So most people have already learned that before college. So now we can take that course and turn it into like broader my computational thinking and that kind of innovative technology stuff. So there's that kind of work going on. So we want exposure to all kids in K through five. There are some really great approaches to integrating computer science in middle school. So you can integrate programming into algebra, you can put data science in social studies and physics. There's lots of places where you can put it. There's a project, Project Guts is integrating like 
application of computing in scientific research in middle school science classes. So there's ways that you can bring it in. You can even use, you know, something like Scratch or Alice for storytelling and book reports in English class. There's lots of ways to start to bring in the content, especially if all the K-5 kids have already learned some like basic coding and stuff in their classes. So that when kids get to high school, they are making an, an informed choice about taking computer science. And about 2010, we started to um, really dig in and worry about how can we work on girls persisting in computer science if they don't even get the chance to take it in high school. So I did a little quick survey among my girls in aspirations in computing, and I was like, have you taken AP computer science? And this girl said, and this really stuck with me, she's like, I'm hoping to take it in the fall. We don't have it at our school. I'm hoping my teacher or the principal will allow me to sit alone in the classroom and work on it by myself. Like, I was like, how hard are we making this for you? Like, how many hurdles do we put in front of kids to actually take this class that they desperately want to take? And um, so, like, for every one of her, there's probably 20 that probably would have taken it, but didn't have the gumption to ask the principal to let them sit alone in a class. You know, like, all of those, we've built the system, it's only for these autodidactic self-starters. Anybody else just doesn't get a chance. So we need all the kids to show up in high school informed. I would really like it if every high school student in the nation had to take a computer science principles type course. Like exploring computer science out of UCLA is fantastic. It's equity based. Because you can't assume that every kid goes home to a house where they have their own device. A lot of kids don't have any opportunity to play. They don't do video gaming. They're not going to maker fairs on the weekends. And so we need all kids in school, which is the only place we reach all kids, to have a fundamental basic experience to understand what it is so that they can make a conscious decision. And then as we go through high school, it should get deeper and deeper and, and have more opportunities for learning. Likewise, in the out of school time, we need computation there. So you might have heard that Girl Scouts recently announced tons of new STEM badges, computer science, cybersecurity. The significance of that is huge because if a little girl at five and then seven and then nine and then 12, computing is right there alongside be a good friend and pet care and, you know, animals, husband, all the things that Girl Scouts learn, right? Trail safety, whatever. It's normal. It's not weird for girls to like computer science if it's something they've done their whole lives. And um, there's so many great ways to take the technology tools, whether it's apps or robotics, and apply those to social problems, which is something, you know, Girl Scouts and other youth organizations like to, like, work on. Boys, uh, Boys and Girls Club has now added a complete progression in computing. And... Um, Ideally, we have a 360 degree surround that kids can get exposed outside of school and then go to a school where they can continue to learn or they can learn in school and then go get deeper experience outside of school. And that we're not just limiting it to the kids that can afford to go to space camp and, and expensive clubs and things like that. Okay, and your second question. Oh. You know, um, Everyone talks about Harvey Mudd as this big shining example of um, how they got more women into computer science and how they met, got to parity, and they're like, every student is required to take computer science. Well, Harvey Mudd is an engineering college, so that's not a stretch. You know, Georgia Tech makes every student take computer science, too. Um, but Harvey Mudd only has 400 students. Like, my high school had 600, so, like, it's a small school. So what you can do at that scale is different. You know, imagine CU Boulder with 30,000 kids trying to, like, force everyone to take intro to computer science. Um, but I think it should be part of some kind of, you know, basic navigating the world kind of thing. You need to know, hopefully we wouldn't have to worry about that because they would have learned it in K-12 when we get to where we're going. Um, but you... There is not an industry that exists where computing is not playing a role. And so this week I was in Detroit and I'm visiting with Quicken Loans. Quicken Loans is deeply invested in computer science education. The biggest tech employer of, the biggest employer of software engineers in the United States is Bank of America. Not Google, not Microsoft. Most of the jobs in tech are not in tech companies. 
you know, Walmart has like 5,000 software engineers. Like it's everywhere. It's in pharma, it's in retail. There's really not a single industry that does not rely on it. So even if you're not going to directly work in it, you need to work with it and you can need to understand what it can do. So I think that's, there should be some fundamental exposure, even if it's integrated into some, you know, intro to technology type course. It's really showing you the, the possibilities and, and also the ethics. One thing that is of great concern, I think, is um, ethics and security need to be in the ice cream, not the cherry. Like, this is a problem. There are entire computer science programs at universities where they do security, like, at the end. Security needs to be totally embedded into the design of the technology. And you need to be thinking about safety and privacy. And you need to be thinking about ethics. Maybe just because you can do something, you should not do it. So the, the famous, um, I'm sure it's going to be now the stories of the, the uh, missile thing that just happened in Hawaii. That's going to be the, the new example in user experience design failure. Um, but the example in ethics courses is... There was an app built a number of years ago. Remember um, um, Foursquare, where everyone's checking in? People, I don't think people use it anymore, but because everyone else has that functionality. But Foursquare had just come on, plus Twitter and Facebook, and everybody was really open with their stuff. So this Russian guy builds this app called Girls Around Me that would basically scrape all the social media and then using mapping technology show you women who were partying at bars near you with their photos so you could go find drunk women. The implications of this are horrible. But this guy knew he could make money off of it, right? So he did it. And it got shut down ultimately because he'd found a hole in you know, Facebook and Twitter and other APIs, and those got shut down and it got resolved, but it was a big court case. Um, you have to be thinking about the implications of the technology you're building, the safety for the users, all of those things. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. So um, everyone needs to be part of that because the people who are making the business decisions, the people who are designing the user interfaces, all of those people are going to be part of, you know, possible catastrophic things such as a missile, you know, accidental missile warning on an entire population of people that could have had, and we don't even know, did it cause car accidents? Did it cause panic, heart attacks? We don't know. So, another question? Yes. I'm wondering how you see MOOCs, Khan Academy, and other online education impacting the accessibility of students to MOOCs. Well, MOOCs are, um, you know, there was all this promise of MOOCs a few years ago, and then there's been kind of some disappointing data on how many people finish them and the racial and gender makeup of the people that do them. I think one of the big barriers to that, at least in K-12 for sure, is the digital divide and access to broadband. Um, so I, I was talking with this woman with the... Um, um, foundation in Detroit and I was like well where are poor kids how are poor kids getting the internet in Detroit they gather in alleys outside people's homes who have internet or they go to McDonald's it's not the libraries that are providing internet for our kids it's not our cities and our public utilities it's McDonald's now like combine that with like poverty obesity consumerism, all those things wrapped up. It's just a terrible story to think about, that kids are huddling at McDonald's to do their homework. So I don't think we're ever going to reach the full potential of things like Khan Academy when kids can't get online, and they can't get online with a device that can use those things. So a lot of what's being developed, I've just recently had this kind of aha moment that a lot of the people who are developing the content, they live in a six-device-per-person universe. They live in Silicon Valley. They live in Seattle. They live in New York. Like I personally, at any given time, I have six devices. A couple, I've got my phone. I've got a couple laptops. I can get to a desktop. I can get online anytime I want. I can even get online with my car. But imagine if everything is being delivered through computing platforms that you have to log on to. That assumes that you can get a hold of your family's singular device for two hours a night all by yourself 
And there was an article in the New York Times about MOOCs where they interviewed this mom. She's a single mom in New York. She had four kids. And she's like, I've got this old desktop computer. It's unreliable. Barely works. I can't afford my kids downloading things on it. I can't take that risk. So even though the, the things might be available, they're not quite really available. And so um, there were a lot of things done through Connect Home and Everyone On and um, the Connect Ed initiative to try to address this. But we still have a really serious um, divide when it comes to access to technology in rural parts of the country. I'm sure we have that problem here in rural Colorado as well. Um, so before we jump into, you know, everything's solved by people doing things online, we have to solve the, the connectivity issue and the device issue. And I also really, devices are going to come and go. There's always going to be a new robot or a new pet tablet or something. But what we really want to teach kids is foundational computational thinking and computer science, which you can actually teach unplugged. You can teach binary unplugged. You can teach sorting networks unplugged. There's all kinds of great ways to teach these concepts without actually using um, a device, per se. I think we're probably out of time. I'm seeing whispering in the back. Um, but if you turn off the, the camera, I'll tell you guys this one story. 